Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to give it a couple more minutes to let everybody get logged in um, and then we'll get started. All right, so it looks as though our attendee number has pretty much stabilized, so we're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's work group on the fiscal year 2022-2023 Clean Truck and Bus Voucher Incentive Project, or HVIP. My name is Andrea Morgan, and I'm the policy lead for our Clean Truck and Bus Voucher Incentive Project, uh, which is better known as HVIP. I'm joined today by several other CARB staff and our partners at CalStart to share details on policy changes under consideration for HFIP for the upcoming fiscal year and to hear your feedback. Before we get started, a little information on workgroup logistics. Today's workgroup is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be posted on CARB's low carbon transportation webpage within the next two weeks. Today's work group is really intended to be a conversation. So throughout the afternoon, we will pause for questions and comments. At that time, we will ask that you raise your hand to let us know that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. CARB staff will then unmute your line. For those of you participating via phone, please press pound two to raise your hand. And you can also use the Q&A box to ask questions. We'll remind you of these instructions throughout the work group. And as always, we appreciate your patience if we run into any technical glitches. So today we'll start off by providing some background on HVIP and our funding plan process. Then we'll move on to sharing information on HVIP reopening data, including voucher requests by fleet size. We'll continue on to discuss several potential policy changes to HVIP including the fleet size limits, which were approved by our board last year, modifications to voucher amounts, potential changes to our school bus set aside, and other changes that are under consideration. We will not be discussing the innovative small e-fleets pilot in detail today, but we do expect that the innovative small e-fleets pilot, or ISIF, will continue to play an important role in piloting new strategies to better support small fleets and independent owner operators during the coming fiscal year. And we anticipate continued funding for ISIF. We expect that ISIF will launch later this summer and we will use feedback from that initial launch to make any necessary policy changes. And we'll discuss those policy changes at future implementation work groups. We do have a lot of material to cover today and limited time. So please keep in mind that this is not the op only opportunity to share feedback with CARB. If you have additional comments, you are always welcome to send them to me via email, or I'm also happy to schedule a time to meet outside of the formal work group and workshop process. Now on to a little background on HVIP. HVIP is the cornerstone of CARB's advanced technology, heavy duty incentives for on road zero emission technologies, including battery electric, fuel cell, and electric power takeoff, or EPTOs. Incentives through HVIP are available statewide on a first come, first served basis, 
with higher voucher amounts available for small fleets located in priority communities. While HDEP started out as a small program with just a handful of eligible medium and heavy duty technologies, we now have over 150 HDEP eligible zero emission trucks and buses showing just how much zero emission technologies have evolved over the past several years. Demand has also grown substantially. In fact, last year, $60 million was requested within a period of nine minutes. HVIP's fleet-friendly nature intentionally minimizes barriers to adopting zero emission technologies, and that has made it an incredibly popular program. Generally, HVIP doesn't require that an existing vehicle be scrapped, making it an ideal way for fleets to try out new technologies or expand their existing fleet. Since 2009, over HVIP has supported over 11,400 vouchers, totaling $837 million. And over 60% of vehicles supported by HVIP will be deployed in priority communities helping to reduce communities' exposure to dangerous air pollutants, as well as noise. CARB strives to maintain a balanced portfolio of available investments to meet the state's air quality and climate goals, and HVIP is one of several programs that support zero emission heavy duty vehicles. Each of these programs have their own distinct goals that support the state's broader strategy. HVIP's goals are formalized through the guiding principles shown on the slide. The guiding principles serve as a metric against which we evaluate potential changes to HVIP policy. We look to these guiding principles, as well as feedback from stakeholders, fleets, and communities every year as we reevaluate HVIP policies to determine if we are meeting goals as part of the process of developing the funding plan for clean transportation incentives. Our process for developing a funding plan follows a similar approach every year and is connected to key points with the development of the state's budget, where funding to support clean transportation and incentives such as HVIP is appropriated by the legislature. To give you a quick overview of this process, each year the governor's proposed budget is released in January. The administration releases what is known as a May revise this year, the May revise came out on May 13th. The legislature finalizes the budget bill and appropriates funding in the summer to early fall. And as the state budget is being developed and approved by the legislature, CARB staff develop a plan on how we would expend the dollars appropriated for clean transportation incentives. This plan is known as the funding plan. We hold a number of public meetings to request feedback and inform policy proposals before ultimately taking the funding plan to our board for consideration. This year, we expect to take the funding plan to our board in November. After the board approves the funding plan, we, get, we begin the implementation process. This typically starts by holding a work group with stakeholders to discuss implementation details. And then the work of distributing the incentives to fleets begins. There are a number of opportunities to participate in the process. We held the kickoff workshop for the funding plan on March 15th. And since then, CARB staff has been holding project specific work group meetings, including a work group to discuss all of our heavy duty investments on March 22nd and the first HVIP specific work group on May 3rd. There is one more funding plan workshop scheduled for July 21st. And as I mentioned earlier, we're also happy to meet with folks individually outside of the formal work group and workshop process. This year, we expect to release the proposed funding plan in early October with a formal public comment period between October 7th and November 7th. And then the CARB board is scheduled to hear the funding plan proposal along with public testimony during its meeting on November 17th and 18th. So what are we trying to achieve today? First off, today is an opportunity for us to share some more data that we've seen from HVIP's reopening. And then we'll briefly share some of the policy changes we're considering, including in this year's funding plan. But mostly we're interested in hearing your thoughts on those policy changes, and if there are other policy changes we should be thinking about. 
We'll take all of your feedback into consideration as we continue to draft the funding plan. Now that I've shared that background, let's move right into discussing the data from HFIP reopening. In 2021, the limited funding we had available for HFIP exceeded demand, and we were forced to close HFIP after it became oversubscribed. We reopened HFIP this year on March 30th with over $430 million of available funding. Within the first 24 hours of reopening, $272 million was requested. When HFIP reopened, it included four funding categories. HFIP standard, a set-aside for drayage trucks, a set-aside for public transit buses, and the public school bus set-aside for small and medium air districts. Currently, we have about $44 million remaining in HFIP standard. Of that, $15 million is reserved for fleets with 10 vehicles or fewer. For the drayage set-aside, Within the first 24 hours, the entire 46 million that was available in the drayage set aside was fully subscribed. But we are continuing to accept voucher requests for, for drayage trucks through HVIP standard. Currently, about $54 million or 82% of the funding remains in the public transit bus set aside. We know that procurement cycles and windows for co-funding opportunities can be difficult for public agencies. So it's not surprising that we didn't have huge demand for the set aside the moment the program reopened. In fact, this really demonstrates why a set aside is important for public transit agencies. The public school bus set aside for small and medium air districts is designed to help school districts replace an old bus with a new zero emission bus. For the first 90 days, priority is given to applicants that are in, a, are in a small air district and a disadvantaged community. That 90 day priority window closes today. Initial application reviews indicate that the, that the set aside will be fully subscribed with over 330 school bus replacements from almost 90 school fleets. Since reopening in March, about 70% of funding has been requested for vehicles that will be domiciled in disadvantaged community. And this year, we're also, we've also continued to see strong participation from small and medium fleets. About half of the fleets who requested vouchers have 50 vehicles or less. We've also posted a handout on our webpage, which shows more details about the voucher requests we've seen to date and breaks it down into vehicle class. I'll drop a link in the chat so that you can see that information as well. Um, so now we'll pause for questions and comments on that initial background and, and data. Aria, do we have any raised hands? Um, good afternoon, everyone. For those of you, uh, for those of you joining us on the web platform, please use the raised hand feature to raise your hand. If you're joining by phone, please. Please, uh, please press pound or hashtag two to raise your hand. When you're called on, please state your name and affiliation. As of right now, there are no raised hands and there are no questions in the Q&A box. I spoke too soon. Ryan Lau, I have unmuted your mic. Ryan, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, thanks for CARB staff for putting on this work, work, working group meeting and for um, allowing us to provide comment. Uh, I do really appreciate CARB staff um, sort of flagging the issues around um, public transit uh, co-funding opportunities and um, just kind of wanted to put a, a point on that. Um, you know, I think some of the timing issues um, with some of the other programs, along with um, the requirements of HFIP kind of, um, 
maybe not syncing up with some of the other uh, requirements of other programs um, may be uh, part of the reason why um, we, we have challenges. And so just want to encourage CARB staff to kind of uh, take a look at that and maybe kind of reassess. Um, so for this portion, that's, that's kind of all I, I had to say, but I, I do appreciate um, the acknowledgement of that. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, we recognize that the co-funding opportunities, particularly for public transit districts, um, it can be challenging. And um, really the goal of HVIP, um, with respect to timing, I know you raised that as a concern. Really the goal of HVIP has always been that funding be continuously available. Um, and we certainly hope that the public transit set aside will help make that be a reality um, for at least public transit agencies. Um, but we're also working to make changes to the HVIP program to, to, to ensure that funding is more continuously available um, for all vehicle types and classes. Um, we're, we're certainly, we've, we've also heard some concerns from public transit um, agencies just on some of the logistics of what's required with an HVIP voucher request, like a purchase order compared to what's required for other co-funding opportunities. And that is, we are willing to look into those details more um, and look for opportunities that we can better align to make it easier on our public transit agency partners. Um, so we certainly encourage you to reach out if you have additional suggestions on, um, on ways that we can make that happen for public transit agencies and make this process easier. Yeah, Andrea, uh, I also appreciate you um, flagging the procurement process, the very elaborate procurement process that public transit agencies have. Um, I also realized I forgot to uh, introduce who I am. Uh, Ryan Lau, external affairs representative at AC Transit. Um, we are uh, the uh, East Bay, uh, San Francisco East Bay uh, public transit provider. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna switch for a minute to questions in the Q&A box because quite a few have gone in. We have a question from Mary Dover. How much did you say is left in the public transportation set aside? Sure, so that's a great question. Um, currently, there are about um, $54 million remaining in the public transit bus set aside. Um, and we do have information available on the HVIP website um, that includes that. So I'll ask one of my colleagues from CalSTAR um, to put a link to where that can be found on the HVIP website. And it shows the breakdown of the funds that are available in HVIP standard, as well as each of the set asides that I mentioned. And then we have a question from Audrey Washington. How many vouchers were issued to drayage trucks? Um, so in terms of vouchers issued to drayage trucks, um, this year we had a total of 530 vouchers issued to drayage trucks, to class eight drayage trucks. Um, and that information is available in the handout um, that I shared a link for in the chat. And then, Okay, I'm not muted. Okay, cool. Are, um, from Robin Van Valkenberg, are there specific funding set asides for different fleet sizes? You mentioned small and medium fleets, but I'm not sure there are specific fleet size slash classes. Yeah, so this year um, within HVIP standard, there is a, a reserve of funding for fleets with 10 or fewer vehicles. Um, so that started out with $25 million um, when we opened HVIP up on March 30th. Um, and now there's about $15 million remaining for fleets with 10 or fewer vehicles. Um, otherwise, there aren't any set asides based off of um, vehicle or fleet size. Thank you, Andrea. I'm gonna move back to the question, um, back to raise hands. LaDonna Williams, I have unmuted your mic. Yes, uh, good evening, LaDonna Williams, all positives possible. Um, I wanted to ask that 70% of voucher requests, um, it says have been in disadvantaged communities. Can you tell me in dollar amount, how, how much has um, went to the disadvantaged communities and if um, there is still funding available through that 70% voucher project? Hi, LaDonna, that's a great question. Thanks for raising it. 
Um, so the the seventy percent that has gone to vouchers um, for disadvantaged communities. Um, let me pull the the dollars. Um, so this year, that's been a total of one hundred and seventy five million dollars. Um, so the the way HDEP is run um, currently is that it is a first come first serve program. Um, so we don't have a set amount of funding that is reserved for disadvantaged communities necessarily, um, but we do have some um, enhancements and bonuses um, to try and encourage more vehicles to be deployed within disadvantaged communities and by small fleets. Um, so for this year, um, any small fleet that's requesting a voucher in a disadvantaged community gets an additional 15% um, over the, the base voucher amount. Oh, okay. So since there is no set, they they still have the ability to apply. Yes, yes, they they absolutely still have the ability to apply, and we okay. certainly um, encourage any fleets located in disadvantaged communities who are interested in transitioning to zero emission um, uh -huh. to apply, and we're happy to help answer questions. Okay, and one last question is what or or how many trucks is considered? fleets, because I know there is a maximum, right, under that that disadvantage that they can't go over. Yeah, so for um, the bonus to receive the enhancements, um, it's um, for fleets located in disadvantaged communities, it would be um, 10 trucks or fewer um, to get that 15% um, bonus. Um, currently, there's not a fleet size limitation in effect. Um, so fleets of all sizes can apply for HVIP vouchers this year. Um, however, last year our board made some changes um, to approve a fleet size limit that will take effect in January of next year. Um, uh -huh. that would limit it to 100 vehicles or less in 2023. Okay, and so if we are referring, because we actually support um, community folks who are truck drivers, you know, fleet owners, if they want to take advantage of this program, it would be through the HFIP, not through another, because it's sort of different layers or different programs that does different things, right? So if they want to take advantage of it, they would go to this website here and contact you all to figure out the process. Yeah, they can certainly do that. And we're certainly help, happy to help um, help direct folks um, if they have any questions. A great first step for folks interested in participating is, in HFIP is if you go to the California HFIP.org um, website, um, there's a list of all the available um, trucks that are eligible for HFIP. Um, okay. And so that's a great first step. Okay, so California HFIP.org. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Next up, we have Michael Pimentel. Michael, I've unmuted your mic. Michael, you have to. Okay, there you go. Yeah, Michael Pimentel, Executive Director of the California Transit Association. Just want to say thanks to ARB staff for hosting this forum. And relative to the HFIP reopening and just building on some of the remarks that Ryan Lau had offered uh, from AC Transit, I do want to highlight that one of the additional complicating factors uh, for the transit industry this year is the advent of a very significant uh, pot of federal dollars in the uh, federal Lono and bus and bus facilities uh, competitive grant programs. Uh, that opened up earlier this year uh, agencies uh, have just submitted uh, their applications uh, for those dollars. Uh, and then given the current structure of HFIP, uh, whereby agencies have to have purchased orders in hand in order to claim vouchers, uh, if agencies were to put in voucher requests today, uh, that would make them ineligible for using the LONO or the bus and bus facilities grants for the same buses. And so we're finding that from our conversations with our member agencies, uh, that agencies are wanting to wait and see what they're going to get from bus and bus facilities and Lono uh, before they come to HFIP uh, with a voucher request. And so uh, we would anticipate there's going to be a notice of funding award at uh, some point later this fall. And I would imagine that at that point, we will see uh, a quick run on the monies in HFIP. Uh, so I just want to offer that as context 
uh, because certainly as you know, folks are looking at the budget, um, you may be wondering <laughs> why is that $50 million still uh, there and, and bedeviling for uh, the industry? Uh, there are some very justifiable reasons. Uh, and then as we go through the rest of today's uh, program, I'll have uh, one uh, other recommendation, but just recognizing that that may be more appropriate for a later time, I'll reserve it for that. So thank you. Thanks for providing that additional context, Michael. Thank you. Next up, we have Adam Browning. Adam, I've unmuted your mic. Thank you, uh, Adam Browning with Forum Mobility. And thank you for sharing the information about the drayage trucks, the number of vouchers that have been issued. Um, I wondered if you had any information on how many of those vouchers have been redeemed to date. Hi, Adam. That's a great question. Um, so let me start by clarifying that the 530 number that I um, referenced um, was only voucher requests since HVIP reopened um, this March, so March 30th. Um, so I, I don't have data on the redemptions off the top of my head. Um, but given that it's only, I, I wouldn't expect that many of um, that 530 would have been redeemed yet, given that it's only been a couple months since those requests were placed. Um, Got it. I, I had gone to the uh, handout that you helpfully provided, and it had the, in addition to the 530, there was um, two, uh, three, 89, 39, uh, I go back to that in a sec. But yeah, I think there's about 289 that were um, vouchers that were requested for class eight drainage trucks last year. Um, I don't have the redemption numbers off the top of my head, um, but that is something that's available on our California HVIP.org website. Um, it, we have a map um, where you can look at the vouchers that have been requested as well as redeemed um, and sort by vehicle classes. And um, so I see that my colleague Tara from CalSTART has provided a link to where you can access that information as well. Gotcha, appreciate that Tara. Um, I might hit you up for help on sorting out specifically for drayage out of that um, data dump. It wasn't immediately um, clear to me uh, how you could do that, but I won't take up your time for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Brad. Brad, I have unmuted your mic. Hello, good evening. Um, Brad Bettisher from New Flyer Motor Coach Industries. A uh, quick question about um, HVIP closing and then reopening. Would it be closing again at the end of this year, given that there, there may be some funding left for, I think Mike was talking about public transit, the 54 million? Although based on his comments, it might get snapped up. But if there is any of that left over, will that continue into January or will HFIP close again for another few months until the typical reopening in March, April? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, so all funds within the set asides um, will continue to be available um, as in, until they have been requested in their entirety. Um, so if any funding is remaining in the public transit bus set aside at the end of December, um, it would roll over um, into next January and continue to be available. Okay, great, thanks. So Aria, I think we have time for about one more question um, and then we should move on to our next topic. Okay. Um, next up, we have Philip Gerritsen. Philip, I have unmuted your mic. Hi, uh, thank you for hosting. Uh, this is Philippe Gerritsen, Director of Fuel Cell Business Development at Nikola Corporation. We're an OEM uh, manufacturing battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell trucks, Class 8 trucks. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the question about how many Class 8 vouchers have actually been redeemed for delivery, similarly have a question about if you have a breakdown of the fleet size demographics um, that could dive into the information in that link that you sent a little bit deeper to specifically look at class eight tractors by fleet size, as it appears that class eight, based upon the numbers you're sharing, would be inclusive of buses and other types of vocational trucks. So do you have a sense on what the fleet size splits look like for class eight trucks specifically, tractors? 
Yeah, that's that is a great question. Um, I I don't have a more detailed breakdown that I can share today um, beyond what's on on that handout. Um, I wondering if um, Tom um, Brotherton from our CalSART team might have any additional info um, to add today. Um, but if not, the, the California um, HVIP.org website is a great resource. And we're, we're also happy to help answer um, requests for additional data um, as needed. Yeah, I've, I've done some analysis on the website and it looks like fleet size is not currently available for download um, on the, those on the available data set. So that'd be helpful if that could be incorporated. Um, and to the earlier question, it looks like from analysis we've done that there have only been 151 class eight tractors according to the data set that you have that have actually been redeemed of which all but 25 are really yard tractors uh, so i think that begs the question of how successful really the uh, hvip has been and thus far ensuring the deployment of class eight trucks into actual operation um, so just wanted to put that out there that it may be a little premature to look at things such as changing the uh, eligibility for large fleets. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Um, I, I think one thing that I'd note um, as we're thinking about the size of, um, of fleets and voucher redemptions is that we have had um, a couple of very strange years with HVIP. Um, and that ties in really well to, to our next um, topic, um, which is really getting into the fleet size limits. Um, so let's let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, um, and we'll we'll continue this conversation. Yeah. So as as we were just mentioning, it has been an interesting couple of years for HVIP. Um, the market demand for zero emission technologies has really seen an incredible growth over the past few years um, with an increasing number of manufacturers entering the heavy duty zero emission market. And um, so demand continues to grow um, due to technical technological improvements, uh, upcoming fleet regulations and a lower total cost of ownership for zero emission trucks. And we really saw a sharp uptick in the demand for HVIP vouchers in 2018 and continued growth for HVIP vouchers through 2019. So ultimately, HVIP was forced to close to new voucher requests in November 2019 after becoming oversubscribed. Um, and after being closed for over a year, HVIP reopened in three waves in 2021, each of which quickly became oversubscribed. So in the final funding wave in October of 2021, $60 million was requested within nine minutes. So recognizing that this unpredictable funding availability really disrupts the market and just detracts from HVIP's broader goals, over the past few years, we've made several changes to HVIP to better manage demand, including reducing voucher amounts. HVIP reopens on March 30th of this year with the highest funding amount available ever in the program's history, uh, nearly $430 million. So we know that many of the measures we've taken to manage demand have been working. Um, even though there was significant pent up demand when HVIP reopened, HVIP has remained open for voucher requests for all vehicle types for about three months. However, with only $44 million remaining for standard voucher requests, it's unlikely that HVIP will remain open for the entire year. So HVIP was always envisioned as an incentive that would be continuously available so that fleets could factor HVIP dollars into their planning when making purchase decisions and be confident that the funding would be available when needed. While HVIP running in a start-stop start nature is disruptive to the zero emission market as a whole, it's particularly challenging for small fleets who are extremely sensitive to both price and time constraints. We know that public agencies also struggle when funding is not continuously available due to their lengthy procurement processes and prescribed budget cycles. So CARB needed to address the challenges faced by these important groups and also address the growing market demand. 
Last year, our board approved fleet size limits in an effort to support more equitable investments and to help manage growing demand within HVIP. These limits are introduced in a phased approach to allow fleets and manufacturers time to plan. Beginning in 2023, only fleets with 100 or fewer trucks or buses will be eligible for HVIP. And beginning in 2024, only fleets with 50 or fewer trucks or buses will be eligible for HVIP. Public agencies and California Native, tribal, Native American tribal governments are exempt from the fleet size limits. Additionally, technologies that are just entering the commercial market, including fuel cell technologies, will not be subject to the fleet size limit until they achieve greater market penetration. The short-term exemption from the HVIP fleet size limits gives fuel cell truck manufacturers certainty that they will be able to benefit from the same incentives their battery electric counterparts did when they first brought their technologies to the market. This policy change was approved after an extensive public process. We heard feedback from some st stakeholders who appreciated the move to focus HVIP on supporting the small, minority and family owned businesses located in their communities that desperately need support to transition to zero emission, as opposed to large fleets that have the capital and resources to make this transition on their own. We also heard concerns from stakeholders that it was too soon and that larger fleets represent the majority of the demand for HVIP vouchers. The conclusions drawn from the data analysis on HVIP voucher requests last year and since HVIP reopened this year demonstrate that there is significant interest in HVIP from medium and small fleets. Of all the public and private fleets that submitted voucher requests this year, about 63% of fleets had 100 vehicles or less. Looking at the voucher re vouchers requested, 43% of voucher requests were from fleets with 100 vehicles or less. This really points to the fact that larger fleets tend to request a higher number of vouchers than smaller fleets. When looking at this data, it's important to remember that public agencies will be exempt from the fleet size limits. If we look at the private fleets with less than 100 vehicles in all public agencies, we find that about 71% of fleets who made a voucher request this year would continue to be eligible in 2023. And just about half of the voucher requests would continue to be eligible. The data we're seeing from this year's voucher requests are pretty similar to what we saw last year, suggesting that what we're seeing this year isn't just a one-time coincidence. Keep in mind that the data reported for this year represents only about one calendar quarter of demand, and that last year HVIP was open only for very limited windows. Given that larger fleets have more resources to track available incentives and the relatively short funding windows, relatively short windows funding has been available, we expect that this data only represents a portion of the demand from small and medium fleets in the state. I'll note that the fleet size data we just shared and that's included in the handout is self-reported by dealers and fleets in the voucher request process. About 80% of fleets have certified that this information is accurate under penalty of perjury, um, but we're continuing to work with fleets to certify that their data is correct and conduct our own verification of the reported fleet size. Taking this data into account and recognizing the slight uncertainty we still consider limiting HVIP participation to those medium and small fleets that are most reliant upon incentives as a necessary and appropriate measure for HVIP to take at this time. From a total cost of ownership perspective, zero emission trucks are already economically advantageous as compared to combustion trucks. We know that the higher upfront cost means that small fleets rely heavily on state incentives in order to be able to make the transition to zero emission. The vast majority of trucking fleets in California have 50 or fewer vehicles. And if we are able to achieve, and if we are to achieve a total transformation of the transportation sector and realize the state's equity goals, we need to begin to provide dedicated support to the medium and small fleets to ensure that they are not left behind. 
when making purchase decisions, large fleets that have greater access to capital are able to take into account the total cost of ownership benefits, as well as upcoming regulations and broader corporate sustainability goals. Continuing to provide large trucking fleets with incentives for purchases that would have occurred anyway is a poor use of limited state resources. It's worth noting that large fleets will still be able to access other incentive programs that encourage the turnover of, exist of the existing diesel fleets, such as the Carl Moyer program and the Volkswagen Mitigation Trust. We are considering making a few minor modifications to the fleet size limits and HFIP as we shift the program to focus more on medium and small fleets. First, we are considering adding an exemption to the fleet size limits for nonprofits with 501c3 tax exempt status. We'd like to ensure that all nonprofits serving our communities continue to have the ability to request vouchers. Secondly, we are considering exempting voucher requests from small fleets with 10 vehicles or fewer from the manufacturer rolling soft cap. The manufacturer rolling soft cap limit was established in 2020 as a way to improve HVIP funding availability and encourage faster vehicle delivery. Under the manufacturer soft cap, each manufacturer can hold up to 100 unredeemed vouchers at a time across all of the manufacturer's HVIP eligible product line and approved dealers. The cap is a rolling cap. So as the manufacturer redeems vouchers, more vouchers become available for vehicles from that manufacturer. Manufacturers can also be granted additional vouchers by car beyond the cap on a case by case basis. Not counting small fleet voucher requests towards the manufacturer caps will help ensure that small fleets and owner operators who are interested in making the transition to zero emission can use HVIP vouchers to purchase the zero emission vehicle of their choice. We have heard feedback and frustration from small fleet owners who have a hard time getting dealers to respond to them, or if they do get a response, are told that the manufacturer's OEM cap has been exceeded so the dealer can't help them. We believe that these changes will help address some of those concerns and will also help HVIP approved dealers feel confident that they will be able to access a voucher for a small fleet owner. Recognizing that there is still some uncertainty with the data and the market currently, we're also considering introducing contingency provisions in the event that demand from medium and small fleets is lower than anticipated. Specifically, if nine months after reopening, more than 25% of funds allocated to HVIP remain, we are considering allowing larger fleets to access HVIP funding. We are considering reducing the voucher amount for such large three fleets through this contingency provision to 50% of the current voucher amount and limiting this contingency to large fleets of up to a certain size. For example, fleets with less than 300 or 500 vehicles, as well as requiring that vehicles purchased through this contingency be deployed in a disadvantaged community. With that, I'll open it up for questions on the fleet size limits. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start calling on raised hands, in an effort to allow as many people to ask questions or state comments as possible, we are asking that you keep your comments or questions as brief as possible. If you have a longer comment or question, we are happy to meet with you outside of this work group to discuss your questions or comments in greater detail. You can use the Zoom feature to raise your hand. For those of you participating by phone, please press pound or hashtag two to raise your hand. When you're called on, please state your name and affiliation. First up, we have Eileen Tut. Eileen, I have unmuted your mic. Hi, thank you, Andrea, and um, and whoever let me speak. <laughs> um, this is Eileen Tut with the California Electric Transportation Coalition, and I just have a lot of comments, so I'm going to try to keep this real, real. Um, short as I can. I just I just feel like you've heard the same things over and over again. And, and I, I will say you've made very, very modest modifications. Um, 
But at the end of the day, uh, there there really is no 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 um, proof that, or even even data that would indicate that somehow small fleets provide more benefits to disadvantaged communities than large fleets. And in fact, my sense is that what we really need is to transition as many trucks as, as fast as possible to, um, to electric. And so it just seems to me to like, rather than trying to limit the number of vouchers that go out, we should be all, and certainly Kelly TC is working very hard to make sure there is adequate and reliable funding to provide continuous HVIP funding, which has never been the case and still isn't the case. And, and I will say though, the, this budget, it looks like there's gonna be approval for some HVIP dollars. So you may not run out this year. And I'm hoping that you will not make any changes, that you will continue the program through the end of the year without the changes. And, and I'm also, I do wanna say that, um, that when we briefed your board after they adopted the regulation, after they adopted the plan last year, which is, it's hard for me to, to agree that you, that there was a, an extensive public process, because although there was, the vast majority of comments were around not reducing, <laughs> like there's no, also no evidence that somehow large fleets at a hundred or less or a hundred or more, or where the cutoff is, it seems completely random where, why it is that they somehow need the funding for trucks that are often twice as expensive as their diesel counterparts. I don't know. I mean, fleets in general are not particularly profitable businesses. And people often point to Amazon. Well, I will just say Amazon is not making its money on the fleet side of its operation. I mean, making fun money off fleets is why truckers are making so such minimal wages and all the tr challenges we have around equity and pay have to do with the fact that these these fleets just that it's it's a very it's a it's a low wage um, low profit margin of you know low profit margin for these for this business case so the idea that somehow large fleets are really profitable and and don't need the funding as as I think you actually said, continuing to provide, to provide HFIP to large fleets that would have purchased ZEVs anyway is a waste of money, but there's absolutely no data that indicates that these large fleets would purchase the ZEV anyway. In fact, I would say quite the opposite is true. Um, the large fleets are really the only ones that are well capitalized enough to purchase these vehicles. So it feels a little bit like I totally think we need to make sure that small and medium fleets, and I think everybody does, agrees that we need to make sure that money goes to them. But rather than just eliminate whole swaths of, of eligible fleets right now, without data that would show that one, there's any increased benefits from doing so, or two, that they need the money any less, there are small fleets that are also quite lucrative. Um, there's, no, there's no data that indicates there's a difference there. Um, that we that we set aside funding for small and medium fleets, and then if it doesn't get utilized, then it can roll over to the large fleets. But just eliminating them at this point is is just doesn't make sense to me. I also feel like this idea that somehow fuel cell trucks um, are exempt from the limit for large fleets seems a little. I will say that your board, by the way, didn't even know they had adopted that <laughs> that particular provision. Every single member we did not know that. That, that large fleets could purchase fuel cell vehicles, but not battery electric trucks. And, and I think we support both, but I will just say that the idea that somehow fuel cell trucks are more affordable or more um, or benefit disadvantaged communities more or have greater barriers. I, I think they have a lot, they have barriers that are greater, but they also get a lot more money. So those, those barriers are addressed. So I, ju I just wanna say that I, I feel like you're gonna hear this again and again over and over, but it's really just not time to eliminate large fleets entirely. I think it is, there is definitely a case for setting aside money that goes to small and medium fleets. And then if it doesn't get utilized, it can roll over. But the idea that you, you've decided without data that these fleets can purchase the vehicles anyway, or that they're somehow um, in, a, in that position, it is not supported by the data. And the idea that perhaps they provide less benefits in disadvantaged communities is also not 
um, substantiated by data. So we're just asking you once again <laughs> to reconsider eliminating large fleets from eligibility and instead focusing funding specifically for small and medium fleets while also allowing large fleets to access the funds. Uh, because to be quite honest, they they do need the funding and they won't buy the ZEVs without it. So, and that's based on our research. You know, we have data that indicates that. So I, I'm kind of confused by this idea that it doesn't matter, we don't give them the money, they're gonna do it anyway. That That is not actually uh, proven by the data. All right, thank you for your comments, Eileen. Um, and in responding to just kind of the general overall theme, um, I, I think we've we've kind of reached the point where demand with an HSIP is so significant um, that there's an opportunity cost associated with each of our dollars. Um, so as we think about who we're giving dollars to, it always mean, it's going to mean that we're we're turning dollars away from someone else. Um, so to us, when we are providing fund, every dollar that we're providing to a, a large or mega fleet is, is a dollar that we don't have available for a smaller fleet. Um, and I'll note that there are proposed regulations coming up that would require many of those larger fleets to stop, to start adopting zero emission trucks. And while those effective dates aren't yet, um, to us, it's that question of, of the opportunity cost. Is it better to, to give funding to a larger fleet a couple years in advance of that um, regulation or to a smaller fleet that's interested in the technology that wouldn't be able to make that transition without funding? Um, so we, we do really see benefit in making sure that we have that dedicated support for smaller fleets. Um, and making sure that HVIP is continuously available for those, those medium and smaller fleets and public agencies. And we have seen a pretty significant amount of demand from those medium and small fleets in those limited windows that HVIP has been open over the past two years. Um, so we do expect to continue to see that demand, particularly as we're able uh, to continue to push out more robust um, outreach measures over the next few years uh, to let folks know that this funding is available. Um, so I'll pause there and we can move on to the next question. Well, if I can just clarify, because the alternative clean fleet rule doesn't just apply to large fleet, it also applies to small and medium fleets, so that everyone will be required. So that that's actually not, not correct. I mean, it, if you're going to cut, the, the then you would cut it to everyone. Um, and I, I don't, I also would love to see the data that you have that shows that large fleets are more capable and would purchase these vehicles anyway, and that small fleets would not purchase or medium fleets would not purchase without the, the, the funding. Because I, I will say, I think it's the biggest barrier for all the fleets, whether you're small, medium or large, is, is really infrastructure and fueling. Um, and that's both on fuel cell and electric. So I just don't, I just don't believe that we are at a point in the market where, where people, but where fleet size determines whether or not you would purchase a truck, a zero emission truck. I think there is a lot more complicated than that. And this market is much more complicated than that. Thanks, Eileen. Thank you. Next up, we have Adrian Martinez. Adrian, I have unmuted your mic. Oh, uh, thank you. Thanks for the informative presentation. Um, I'm Adrian Martinez on behalf of Earth Justice. Um, you know, on this issue, you know, we've had time to kind of dig into some of the information and we kind of, we tend to agree that cutting off HVIP funding for the larger fleets isn't warranted at this time. We completely agree with staff's assessment to give the thumb on the scale for small and medium sized fleets. We think that's a really important aspect, you know, perhaps it could be viewed in the opposite way, have some allocation for larger fleets. We also think if you continue to fund larger fleets, you could do um, innovative policies, you know, for potentially to push these larger fleets to deploy more. Um, because while we're seeing, you know, a handful of truck deployments now, we aren't seeing as many larger deployments, companies ordering um, 10, 20, you know, potentially even 50. So how can we get more vehicles? And because I think one of the things that 
is <laughs> kind of sobering is how many vehicles we need to get on the roads to tackle our air pollution and climate harms. And so we really encourage kind of looking at this as an opportunity to push for more vehicle deployments, especially with larger fleets, and then also kind of focus on those fleets that are going to have benefits for disadvantaged communities. Um, we 100% agree with the fuel cell um, um, <laughs> question. It seems kind of arbitrary to give fuel cell trucks the benefit um, without the same going to electric. And this might be a change that ultimately goes down down the road, you switch back. But, you know, we think at least for this next year and potentially even the year after that, keeping some pot for larger fleets, including those that might do larger scale deployments, um, would be good. And we think it's, um, we agree that on the benefits, we think there are a lot of fleets that aren't making these decisions to go to zero emission, and they should. And then finally, one thing I'd encourage, the, th the, the fear we have on the larger fleets being iced out of HVIP is that, you know, they're going to turn to programs like the SCE low carbon fuel standard holdback funds, which have a, has a really innovative program for drayage trucks. And these are the types of programs that the small and medium fleets should be taking advantage of. But unfortunately, if, you know, the bigger fleets are snatching up all that money, um, you know, we may not see smaller fleets and medium sized fleets taking, availing themselves of this Edison money, which, um, also has the benefit of connecting them with an energy provider to address some of the infrastructure challenges. So um, we'll be following up with some written comments down the road, but we really appreciate the attention to this issue and the great presentations from staff and all the informative um, links to the information on the website. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. And just to follow up a little bit on the, the fuel cell issue, um, I, I do wanna know, um, fuel cells are at a much different point in the commercialization process than battery electric. Um, currently, we don't have any uh, fuel cell trucks that are eligible within HVIP. Um, so we do think that, it, that providing fuel cells with that additional support, um, at least for a limited term and this limited exemption, um, is important to help support those first deployments of um, fuel cell trucks. Um, battery electric trucks have had um, that opportunity over the, the past several years. Um, and so now it's, it's a good chance to, to make sure that we're providing the same support for fuel cells. Um, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Peter. See that I turned my camera on. Thanks, Andrea. And Adrian, I wanted to maybe just dig a little bit deeper into one of the areas that you were talking about in that, um, you know, incentives have long played an opportunity to encourage larger fleets um, to deploy more advanced technology vehicles than, than they would otherwise. Um, and certainly HVIP has, that has been one of the goals of HVIP for a number of years. I think what you're seeing in a lot of the staff uh, recommendations, both last year and continuing into this year is a recognition that the market has grown significantly from the early days of HVIP. Um, you know, we often talk about the growth in the manufacturer diversity, but we're also seeing now, as Andrea mentioned, um, really strong um, uh, demand from the smaller fleets, probably more demand than a lot of us would have expected. So what you see is, is the program adjusting to that really very positive growth in the market. And so when you look at recommendations and, and, and proposals like shifting more of the funding to smaller fleets rather than larger fleets, not doing it immediately, but signaling that over time as we have done. I think that's largely in recognition of making sure that the investments, that we've got the policies in place before um, to make sure that the investments are really driving purchase decisions and really influencing a purchase transaction that would not have happened otherwise. Now, what I wanted to, to maybe um, just tee up a little bit more and see if you had any, any additional thoughts on this, or maybe we could have an offline conversation later, um, is the concept of encouraging larger fleets to buy more vehicles than they would otherwise. Because I think what we're anticipating um, in, in, the, in, you know, in, the, in the realistic future is that demand for a program like this, given the number of vehicles that, that, that are available and given a lot of the other market factors, demand is likely to exceed 
our, our available funding, even with the significant funding that's that we have on the table this year and what's been uh, proposed for next year. So it becomes a question of, as we anticipate moving later into a future fiscal year, we have a we have a decision to make about where do we get the most benefit in terms of our equity goals and in terms of our emission reduction goals. So you can envision a scenario where we could early in the fiscal year drive more purchase transactions from a larger fleet perhaps, but that means that that fund, funding is gone and no longer available to a smaller fleet later in the fiscal year. So as Andrea pointed out, there's an opportunity cost with that. Those dollars, limited dollars, can either be used to encourage larger fleets to make more purchases, which is a good thing, right? Before they would normally be expected to make those purchases. But what do we really get out of that as a state? We perhaps get a vehicle on the road, maybe a year or two or more uh, before, before the, that truck would already would be on the road anyway, versus having the funding available to a small fleet that without the incentive funding would never have an opportunity perhaps um, to purchase a zero emission truck, at least within um, the time frame that the costs still remain high. So that's part of the consideration. That's some of what goes into the thinking behind these proposals. And I'm just encouraging all stakeholders to think about that as they um, continue to work with us and help shape this plan moving forward. We don't expect that we're gonna have enough funding to always be able to meet all the market demand out there. But that's a good opportunity for us to make sure that we're being really strategic in how we drive those dollars and meet all of our various goals. So um, happy to hear your thoughts on that now, or perhaps more appropriately, we can continue the dialogue after this meeting. So thanks a lot for that. Thank you, Peter. So just know everyone, we've got a lot of raised hands and a lot of questions in the Q and A box. We only have time for, I wanna say one or two more hands, um, but we will get to everyone um, there is an opportunity at the end to ask questions and follow up and all that. Um, next up, we have Bill McGavern. Bill, I've unmuted your mic. Thanks, Bill McGavern with the Coalition for Clean Air. Uh, and I just wanted to briefly say that I think these potential adjustments, the fleet size limits that you floated here uh, are very well thought out and sensible and you know well targeted at particular problems. So exempting nonprofits, exempting small fleets from the manufacturer cap and the contingency measures. Uh, we support all of those and hope that they'll be incorporated. So thanks a lot. Thank you for those comments, Bill. And I think we have time for one more, Andrea, yes? Yes, we should have time for another, another question. Awesome. Um, LaDonna Williams, I have unmuted your mic. Yes, hi, again. Um, so I just, I had a question about the exemptions. Um, it said that the public agencies and the California native tribes um, are exempt from the fleet size. So I was just wondering if in fact there is any uh, plans, and I've raised this issue, you know, through the clean cars and what have you, um, as well, but is there any plans to to make uh, Black Americans a priority? Uh, because when we look at the numbers, whether it's clean car vouchers or the trucking, which I still have yet to see those numbers as far as um, Black Americans, the support that they're getting, but they still continue to be the lowest supported population when it when it comes to minorities, they kind of lump us all together. And so we notice, you know, this has always been a policy where Native Americans have that special privilege through sovereign, you know, the sovereignty issue and right to, de to determination. So they are treated as a protective class. What plans are there to do the same for Black Americans who continue to be the least supported? Thank you for that question, um, LaDonna. That's a really great question. Um, so at this point, um, we are continuing to explore other measures um, that we could put into place to either um, 
change um, requirements for who's eligible or provide additional exemptions um, or provide increased voucher amounts to try and um, help make it easier for certain groups um, to receive funding. Um, so that is something we can certainly look into, um, the, the support that we can provide directly um, to Black um, truck owners, um, as well as what additional outreach and uh, targeted outreach is really necessary to help make sure um, that Black um, truck owners and operators have access um, to these funds and know that they're available. Um, so really appreciate you bringing that up um, and we're, we're happy to discuss more um, if you have suggestions on how, how we can best target those funds. Thank you very much. Um, Aria, I think we might have time to, to take one more question before we move on to the next section. All right. Uh, Omar Gonzalez, I have unmuted your mic. Omar, you'll, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Good afternoon. Omar Gonzalez, Government Affairs Manager uh, for Nicola. Um, just echoing comments from past work group meetings and restating our position, we do not support the fleet size limitations as proposed uh, and recommend excluding class eight, specifically class eight zero emission vehicles from the policy until there is widespread deployment. Um, we understand the timing for fleet size limitations for low, lower vehicle classes and other vehicle types might be right. Um, but that is not the case for class eight zero emission vehicles and elimination of HVIP will remove a key tool to build market adoption among the large fleets that smaller fleets and owner operators look to for best practices and to take the risk in demonstrating new technology. Our large scale fleets are still struggling to justify the economics as the required infrastructure for zero emission class A deployments is slow, bureaucratic and costly. Our small customers have repeatedly stated that they appreciate the role larger fleets play in terms of adoption. It's not only economies of scale to drive down vehicle costs, but also the cascading effects of better insurance and leasing rates, of more clarity and less risk and predicted maintenance cost of the new technology, reduced cost and further stimulation of the charging refueling infrastructure supply chain. And the list goes on. Small fleets look at the larger players as the critical enabler that they need to deploy vehicles. And large fleets play a very important role in driving availability of trucks in the secondhand market. Even with HVIP, it is not cost effective for an owner operator to transition from their used diesel truck to a new zero emission truck. It would make more sense to incentivize new zero emission trucks so they can enter the secondhand market in three to five years and be available for the owner operators at a significant discount, thereby maintaining jobs and autonomy desired by owner operators. Additionally, BEVs and fuel cells are still being proven in the class eight space. The state needs to ensure that both remain eligible for HVIP Fuel cells in particular will accommodate longer ranges, faster fueling times, and higher payloads than BEVs, making them suitable for a broader swath of the trucking industry. Uh, as my colleague Philippe mentioned earlier in comments, only about 10% of the vouchers issued for class eight zero emission tractors have actually been redeemed by customers. 151 trucks out of a total of 1400 truck vouchers. So there's no proof that these vehicles will meet the commercial requirements of customers in this space. And there have been other consistent challenges that continue to plague the class eight space, such as the availability of infrastructure. Out of the OEMs that have actually delivered, none have actually delivered an over the road truck. So it's too early to say that the program has been successful in the zero emission vehicle class eight adoption uh, space, given the low number of vehicles actually deployed into service and thus funding should remain for this class of trucks. Um, further, given the lack of deployment of trucks into the market, CARB should keep the program open to large fleets so they can adjust and select the newest technology or products that meet their needs rather than being stuck with old vouchers for trucks they can't receive or no longer wish to take delivery of. Um, and I'll, I'll end there and we'll mention, Andrea, that uh, we'll follow up with additional comments and in uh, a one-on-one -on -one meeting request if, if, uh, if, if you're available in, in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Omar. We'll keep an eye out for the, your additional comments and that um, request. Um, uh, Aria, I know we still have a lot of raised hands. Um, let's try and get one more in uh, and then we'll move on. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, yeah, Parker Meeks, I have unmuted your mic. Thank you very much, and thanks again for the opportunity. I'm Parker Meeks, Chief Strategy Officer for Hyzon Motors, and I want to comment on the 
um, large fleet exemption for fuel cell trucks. And just want to support the comments Andrea made. Fuel cell trucks are really in their infancy and being deployed, even as it relates to battery electric trucks, particularly in the heavy duty segment. We're fortunate enough to have received our executive order from CARB for our fuel cell uh, powertrain, um, but you know that's still a very, very early stage deployment. And the facts are that the costs of those trucks have not benefited from scale, even to the extent that battery electric heavy duty trucks have. And additionally, the infrastructure challenges for fuel cell trucks I would say exceed those from a density standpoint about electric, given the lack of trucks on the road to a day. So we firmly believe that, you know, keeping large fleets in the program is appropriate for fuel cell trucks in particular to help us get that deployment that we need to get the industry started, to get the density we need um, on the roads to start to put fueling stations in that will benefit small fleets as well and uh, provide our, our, our full support for that. Thank you. Thanks, Parker. All right. Um, with that, unfortunately, I think we need to move on to the next topic. Um, I know there is a lot of interest in the fleet size limit. So as we've mentioned earlier, you are welcome to reach out to me to submit written comments um, or to request a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, we'd, we'd be happy to make that happen for folks um, who didn't have a chance to raise their questions or points today. Um, so, Rochelle, can we move on to the next slide, please? All right, so our next topic is voucher amounts. Um, so each of the vouchers are really intended to offset a portion of the incremental cost of advanced technologies. And every year we reevaluate our voucher amounts to ensure they're set to an appropriate level to impact purchase decisions and take into account any changes in technology costs. In 2020, we made significant changes to HBIP's voucher structure and amounts for all vehicle classes. On average, voucher amounts were reduced by 20%. This year, we are considering several changes to voucher amounts targeted to specific vehicle types and classes. First, we are considering extending the 25% voucher enhancement for zero emission drayage trucks so that we would continue to offer $150,000 vouchers for zero emission class eight trucks performing drayage operations through December 31st, 2023. This voucher enhancement first took effect with the launch of Project 800 in 2021 an initiative designed to help jumpstart this important segment by supporting the purchase of 800 drayage truck orders in California in 2021. While we have now surpassed that goal, transitioning drayage trucks to zero emission remains an important priority to support Governor Newsom's executive order N7920 and to help reduce emissions in some of California's most impacted communities. Secondly, we are considering introducing a similar 25% voucher enhancement for zero emission refuse trucks. As with drayage trucks, this voucher enhancement would be available for a limited period of time, and it is intended to support the early deployments of these relatively new to market technologies. While seven manufacturers currently offer zero emission refuse trucks, voucher requests for this market segment have been relatively low, with less than 50 voucher requests for zero emission refuse trucks to date. Refuse trucks are present in all of our communities, but their impacts are felt particularly strongly by communities located near waste transfer stations who are burdened by multiple pollution sources. We envision this voucher enhancement being available until December 31st, 2023. And third, we are considering adjusting the voucher structure for electric power takeoff technologies to better accommodate their use in heavier applications and their use on zero emission trucks. Electric power takeoff, or EPTOs, allow for zero emission operation of ancillary systems, such as cranes or compressors on a vehicle, resulting in significant emission and noise reductions. Specifically, we are considering adding a new funding level for EPTO systems with a storage capacity of greater than of greater than 30 kilowatt hours and setting the voucher amounts for $50,000 for this new higher energy capacity. Currently, the higher, highest energy capacity tier is 15 kilowatt hours, 
with a voucher amounts of $40,000. We're also considering allowing APTO systems to fund up to 65% of the total incremental cost. Currently, HVEP limits EPTOs to covering no more than 50% of the incremental cost. With that, I will open it up for questions. Thank you. Um, first up, we have Andy Schwartz. Andy, I have unmuted your mic. Hey, apologies. Actually, my hand was up for the earlier um, conversation, so I don't want to take time here, but if there's an opportunity to talk at the end, I'd, I'd be happy to take that, that time there. Thanks, Andy. Um, next up, we have Dusty Garland. Dusty, I have unmuted your mic. Hi there, Dusty Garland from Peterbilt. Uh, I just had a, a quick comment and a question and then a quick thank you. So first on the comment of the 25% bonus for refuse trucks, I definitely would support that and think uh, our customers would appreciate it as well. I do have a question about the EPTOs uh, and how the how this part would work. So the 25% bonus for the refuse trucks would put it to 150,000. Almost every refuse truck will have an EPTO on it. Is it possible for a customer to apply for the EPTO going on an HVIP funded vehicle? Hi, Dusty. Um, so we would imagine, I imagine we would be limiting the EPTO plus up um, so that it's, it's only for EPTOs that aren't already built into the structure of whatever the zero emission truck is on the HVIP website. Um, so, for example, if there is a zero emission refuse truck that is HDF eligible, um, that EPTO, um, it, essentially, the, the EPTO already included in that system um, would be included within the $150,000 um, plus up for zero emission refuse trucks, and you wouldn't be getting an additional bonus for, the, for, an, for another EPTO, essentially. Um, but if there was a case where there is some sort of zero emission truck um, that is HVIP eligible that ne needs a unique EPTO system for a part of its duty cycle or work truck nature, um, I, there, it is possible that we could have that ability to stack. Um, and we'd certainly be interested in comments on that. Okay. Yeah, understood. I just wanted to clear that part up. I think it, it will be possible, um, even when we look at some of the class eight trucks uh, and tractors as we get into things like even dump bodies or, or whatever it is, I think that opportunity is going to come up a few times. And so just want to make sure it's something you guys have cleared up as you work through, uh, you know, future rulings or plans for the funding. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to say I appreciate you taking our questions and our comments. I think last time I mentioned something about in case we're wrong about small seats, can we have a contingency? And to hear you guys come out the very next time with something to accommodate that um, and just make sure there aren't used funds. I appreciate that a whole lot. Thank you. Yeah, but thank, thank you for those comments, Dusty. Next up, we have uh, Darlene Jones. Darlene, I have unmuted your mic. Darlene, you'll need to unmute on your end. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you, um, the HBIP team up in Sacramento. You guys are relentless. You know, you get, you, you, you get the Lombardi trophy from me, okay? Because you guys have been working with us for such a long time. I am a minority women owned small trucking firm. And we have this wonderful opportunity to work on a California high speed rail. And I would like to show up with an electric truck. I would like to be the first minority owned woman business with an electric truck. I am also listening to everyone here. I want to be in the database. I would like to have Peterbilt, Volvo, Mac, any of the major manufacturers. I want to talk about sponsorship. 
for us and showcase their product for that, you know, that towards our goal. And I, my question is tonight, why hasn't the SBA or iBank, why haven't those two funding resources tried to reach out to trucking companies to make it possible for us to even be counted? That's what I wanna know. How come people are not thinking outside the box as long, you know, as far as getting us the financial resources that we need to acquire this $450,000 worth of equipment? You know, the voucher is nice, but it's not enough. Let's just be realistic. You want our companies to grow and thrive here in California? We need funding and we need it now. Thank you. I'll take my answer offline. Well, I wanna take just a second. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll certainly have a follow-up conversation with you. Definitely welcome that. But I, I also wanna just take a second to thank you for joining us today. I think we bend over backwards to make sure that we have a really robust public process, but sometimes uh, it can be challenging to reach folks that um, that just don't have a lot of time in the day to spend with us at a at a two hour or even longer um, work group or workshop. So hearing that from you is really important to us and figuring out how we can adapt our programs to meet the unique needs of very small fleets, um, fleets that are owned by minority community. Um, we know that there's a tremendous amount of diversity in the kinds of ways that we could be helping small fleets. So this is really, really um, important. And we just want to recognize um, the fact that you took time out of your, your day, your limited availability uh, to spend some time with us today. Um, we'd love to dig in deeper with you. I'll just say real briefly, you know, we have uh, started building um, components of our programs to help see what's best to help meet, meet the needs of small fleets. We've got the innovative small e-fleets pilot project that Andrea mentioned. We need to spend a lot more time talking about that offline, um, but it is an opportunity that's specifically designed to give us some feedback and some lessons learned to help take those and build them into HFIP so that we can make HFIP work better for small fleets in the future. So again, just wanna thank you for being here today and hope that we can connect and, and continue to to pick your brain on how we can help more. Thank you. Um, so we have time for one more raised hand. Uh, Jamie Levin, I have unmuted your mic. Uh, thanks very much. Andrea, well, I have a question and then a quick comment. Uh, so the 25% uh, bonus for early adopters on zero emission, you mentioned that brought the total to 150,000, but what is it for fuel cell? Um, so the, the way the modification would work, um, there's a double the base, bon um, base voucher amount for fuel cells. So that would be, oh, math is hard um, off the top of my head, Jamie. Um, but it's, they have the, an additional $120,000 um, for that. So it would bring the total up um, to 270 for a fuel right. So that's a... It's a reduction, obviously, from the what used to be the 300,000, and I know there were other reductions. I hope not. As we look towards next year, there's not a continuous reduction, certainly as it relates to fuel cell. I appreciate that the CARB staff recognizes uh, the value of fuel cell technology. Uh, just as a comment to respond to what Peter asked earlier, I think there are two key factors that are going to launch us in the commercialization stage of zero emission trucks and vehicles, certainly as our experience with class A. One is achieving TCO, and the other is driving up volumes to get to that TCO. And what we see with many of the fleet operators, regardless small or large, and this has been touched on by some of the other speakers, it's all about not just the cost of the vehicle, but it's also related to the servicing of that vehicle and the fuel for the vehicle and the ability for that vehicle to meet 
a trucker's duty cycle. Uh, uh, Nicola previously commented about range, uh, fueling time, and payload benefits with fuel cells. And those are critical issues. Uh, even though we have some benefits with fuel cell uh, curb weights on tractors less than battery electric, it's still not where it needs to be, where a trucker needs to not just move 40,000 pounds of payload, which a fuel cell class eight tractor can accommodate, but they need to move 50,000 pounds or more. And so we're gonna to have to continue to think and understand what's going to make this work for the fleet operator, and, and that's TCO. Uh, the last comment, and you've heard me bring this up before, we would really like to see a change in how the combined grant funding sources uh, are, are as, as CARB considers them, applies not to the M just the MSRP, but MSRP and uh, excise taxes and sales taxes associated with trucks. Uh, as we're trying to launch fuel cell trucks into the marketplace, people are having to still pay an equivalent amount of tax to a, buying a diesel tractor. And if we really want to make this affordable, uh, we need to look at ways to bring the cost down. And I, I hope you'll give some serious consideration to expanding the total uh, amount of the vehicle as we bring in other sources of grant funds to stack onto HVAC. Yeah, thanks for your comments there, Jamie. Um, we, I think we do recognize that there are um, certainly cost concerns associated um, across the board with technologies, um, but with fuel cell in particular. Um, so appreciate your comments there and suggestions on ways that we can, can make um, HVIP work better um, for those technology types. Andrea, this is uh, Jessica Johnson. Can I just jump in here? Um, I wanted to add something to Peter's response to Ms. Darlene Jones. Um, uh, Darlene, I'm a manager here at CARB, and uh, one of the programs that my staff and I are working on is um, uh, in close coordination with the HFIT team. I don't want to take too much time from uh, this meeting because I know there's a lot going on, um, but uh, a recent bill was passed in October that requires CARB to take a look at um, how to help help uh, fleets make the transition to zero emission um, with a special focus on uh, smaller fleets and fleets in disadvantaged and underserved communities. Um, we're going to be starting that effort here with a listening session in late July. Um, I believe it's the 28th. Um, the uh, meeting announcement for that meeting is going to be coming out in the next week or so, and we're going to be using uh, at least the same mailing list that we've sent uh, that, that you probably received this invitation from. Um, so if you're on that list, you'll also get that, that announcement when that comes out. And we're going to be uh, working uh, to um, extend some personal invitations to fleets that we've already talked with. I heard um, uh, Ms. LaDonna Williams earlier, and uh, she's had a lot of good conversations with us. And, and we'd invite uh, anybody um, who's interested, especially the smaller fleets um, and fleets in disadvantaged communities or underserved populations to please join us. We really want to hear about it. Um, and we have a special focus there. So that's going to be kind of kicking off the process in July, and it's going to be a longer term process. Um, but I'll, uh, I'd invite you to follow up with me offline too, and I can tell you more about it. And uh, I'll put my name, my email address and name in the chat. So anybody who's interested in that opportunity, please, please let me know and I'll make sure to forward you the announcement when it's out. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and fortunately, we have a couple more topics. Um, so I do want to move on to our next topic, which is the public school bus set aside. Um, so I will turn it over to my colleague, Heather Choi, to lead us in the discussion there. Heather? Hi. Oh, also, um, just to add on, uh, if anybody wants to know, the bill that she was, uh, Jessica was talking about is called SB 372. 
I think. Gosh, there's so many to keep track of. Um, anyways, hello, my name is Heather Choi, and I am the project lead for the public school bus set aside. I presented initial recommendations for administering the second installment of $135 million for the school bus set aside in May this year. For today's discussion, I will up update you about the potential modifications we are considering, including voucher amount adjustments and adjustments to the eligibility criteria used for participation. Currently, the voucher amounts range from $350,000 to $400,000, depending on the type and feature features of the school bus. And again, this is just in the school bus set aside. Along the same lines as voucher reductions for the class three vehicles that Andrea just discussed, we are considering reducing voucher amounts by a modest range of five to 10% for the school bus, school buses funded through the set aside. We're considering reducing voucher amounts in this category to better align with base prices and incentive amounts nationwide and help our limited incentive dollars help more school districts transition to zero emission. The next modification we are considering is regarding eligibility criteria. Set, up, set aside funds for the school buses are prioritized to ensure turnover of the dirtiest school buses in rural and underserved communities in the state. As a top priority school bus fleets, those in small and medium sized air districts located in disadvantaged communities are funded CARB is considering additional metrics in an effort to ensure funding continues to be available to turn over the dirtiest school buses in historically underserved school communities. Such metrics include looking at high student enrollment and free and reduced lunch programs. Um, and we also will conduct further analysis utilizing school district data to inform any modifications to participation. Additionally, now that the initial 90 day application window from the first year's allocation is closing today, we will have access to a wealth of data to see which fleets opted, opted to participate, look at where the oldest school buses are still located in the state and incoming purchase order pricing information to inform our final recommendations. I look forward to hearing your input on these modifications today. And with that, Aria, I am ready if anybody has a hand up. Thanks, Heather. Uh, we have Anjali. Anjali, I have unmuted your mic. Uh, hey, thank you. I'm sorry, Heather. My question was actually for Andrea for the pre prior section. Um, I can keep it till the end of this or, uh, or go ahead now, whatever you guys prefer. I'll, we'll wait for, for the next step. Let's uh, hear from anybody on the school bus set aside item first. Thanks, so. though. All right. Um, Jolene Fuentes. I've unmuted your mic. Jolene, you'll need, uh, excuse me, Jolene, you'll need to unmute your mic on your end. Um, it doesn't look like she is responding. So there are no raised hands uh, that pertain to the school bus set aside. And there are no questions in the Q&A box that pertain to the school bus set aside. Okay, well, I will be here in case uh, anybody has questions at the end. Um... Actually, Heather, I'm sorry. We have a question from George Flores. Um, we have four, we have four, model year 2000 buses, would we be able to scrap that and be compensated or given a voucher for it? Yeah, I saw, I saw George, that's George, right? The, in the chat or in the Q and A box? Yes. Um, well, one thing to clarify is it seemed like those buses that they're talking, he's talking about are maybe transit buses or charter buses. And so if they're not school buses, then um, there is no scrappage through HVIP. The school bus set aside in um, administered through HVIP um, program is the only part that requires scrap um, of a school bus. So 
for George, if it's not a school bus, then you don't need to worry about uh, scrapping or having any um, old school bus to re be replaced. It's not a replacement program, um, but hopefully that makes sense. Thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the Q&A box or any raised hands about school buses. Okay, well, Andrea, you're next. All right, thank you, Heather. Um, so moving on um, to other policy changes under consideration. Um, so we are considering a few additional policy changes this year. Uh, first, we're considering expanding the vehicle to grid or V to G capability requirement that was introduced in the public school bus set aside to apply to all school buses within HVIP. Vehicle to grid technology may play an important role in building a resilient grid and meeting California's broader energy goals. School buses have been demonstrated to have an optimal duty cycle to support V2G applications, and thus school buses will likely serve as an initial beachhead for V2G technologies. We are considering introducing this requirement for all school buses beginning January 1st, 2024. Secondly, in response to AB 794, we will be adding some additional measures to help support important protections for drivers by ensuring that fleets receiving state incentive dollars adhere to labor standards and do not misclassify drivers. Specifically, fleets will be required to attest that they are in compliance with labor standards and that they will remain in compliance with labor standards for at least three years. Fleets will be required to reattest that they are in compliance annually for three years after the redemption of the voucher. CARB will also publish a list of all fleets that receive HVIP vouchers, and we will follow up on any allegations received by third parties that claim that a fleet which received an HVIP incentive is not in compliance with state labor standards. Prior to awarding a voucher, we will also check for labor standard violations on the list maintained by the Department of Industrial Relations. I'll also note that at our May 3rd work group, we had discussed potentially extending the length of the ownership, ownership requirements and warranty requirements. Based on stakeholder feedback, we have decided to delay moving forward with those changes, um, but we will continue to evaluate if such changes will be needed in the future years. Uh, with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Aria? Okay. Um, first up, we have Nakia Hines. Nakia, I have unmuted your mic. Nakia, you'll need to unmute on your end. I apologize about that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I want, my question is, who finances um, for disadvantaged uh, communities with small businesses that have um, one or two trucks? Hello? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> there are a number of different funding opportunities that could be available for you. Um, one um, would be HVIP, the program that we were discussing today. Um, mm -hmm. Another program that I'd really encourage you to look into and that we'll be releasing soon um, is known as our Innovative Small E-Fleets Pilot or ISIP. Um, and that's really designed to support small fleets. Um, so we're looking primarily at fleets with uh, 20 trucks or fewer and less than 15 million in, in, in annual revenue. Um, and so that, that program will provide a few more options as well as higher voucher amounts um, to really support the unique needs of small fleets. Um, I know my colleague Jessica Johnson mentioned earlier um, that we'll be holding a work uh, listening session at the end of July um, to get additional feedback and hear if there are other areas that we should really be supporting more. Um, and I'd also note that Jessica manages a, a program um, that is the truck loan assistance program. And that can be used and stacked um, with other, other programs to help provide fair financing uh, for zero emission trucks. 
Um, so those are a few of, of the resources. Um, I'm happy to follow up with you in more detail uh, later with some additional links on where you can find details about those programs um, and help find what incentive dollars best meet you. Okay, is um that that's great. And what was the name of the company, the business, the company again? And also, can you um, drop the links in the conversation, uh, the conversation inboxes? Uh, yes, I will ask that um, some of my colleagues at help pull links um, for those um, programs and share them in the, the chat. Um, in terms of the incentive programs that I mentioned, um, the first is HBIP, um, and that's you can find information on that at CaliforniaHBIP.org. Um, through the HBIP program, um, there's also a program that will be launched soon. Um, called the Innovative Small E-Fleets um, Pilot. Um, and that will be really focused and targeted um, towards small fleets and independent owner operators. Um, so we definitely encourage you to look into that. Um, and then we also have our Truck Loan Assistance Program, um, which provides fair financing opportunities um, for both zero emission trucks as well as um, cleaner diesel trucks or um, natural gas trucks. Um, so those are those are all some resources and hopefully <laughs> you should get some links in um, there shortly. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up, we have Eileen Tutt. Eileen, I have unmuted your mic. Oh, thank you, Eileen Tutt with the California Electric Transportation Coalition. I just want to say that I don't, I would not uh, support requiring the vehicle to grid capability for school buses. Um, I think it's great and uh, great application in, in most cases. It probably does make sense, but we don't want to put any barriers in front of a school district um, that maybe it just doesn't make sense. So I think, in fact, the truth is V to G or vehicle grid VGI capabilities make sense for a lot of fleets, not just school buses. And where they do, they will happen because of the value proposition. But we wouldn't want not want to see school buses in particular carved out. And you know, you have to. We would not want to see a requirement. Although I I want to say I appreciate. Uh, what CARB staff is trying to do. I just don't think the idea of requiring it is a good idea. I think encouraging not just school buses, but all fleets um, to consider the benefits of vehicle grid integration is, is a good idea. Or even just saying, reach out to your utility. <laughs> that would be great, but thank you. Thanks, Eileen, for those comments. Um, one thing I'll note on the, the V2G requirements, um, this is something that is already required um, within our public um, school bus uh, set aside that we have in place this year. And we still have seen um, substantial participation from manufacturers um, with uh, school buses of every type um, being available that meet the V2G requirements. Um, and most manufacturers were able to participate and ensure that V2G functionality was included with their buses. Um, and several others indicated that they expect to be able to provide that functionality soon. Um, with this requirement, we certainly would not intend to require the school district to actually use the V2G technology. Um, but since we know schools often hang on to buses for a long period of time, we do want to make sure that they, they have that as an option. Um, should they later down the road decide that V2G would be something that makes sense for them. Um, we don't want them to, to miss out on the chance of having that opportunity when they make the, the transition for their bus, um, which often happens pretty rarely for school districts. Um, certainly appreciate the point that V2G um, could be important um, for more than just school bus applications, and it is something that we're we're considering um, in future years if if there are ways that we should either be requiring or incentivizing uh, the use of V2G technologies further uh, within HVIP. Thank you, Andrea. Um, we don't have any more raised hands and there are no 
new questions in the Q&A box that relate to this. Great, um, thank you, Aria. Um, we do have a bit more time, um, so I think we can open it up for two to three additional questions um, on any topic that was discussed today. Okay, um, first up we have Anjali. Anjali, I have unmuted your mic. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, Andrea, I was actually writing out an email in case time ran out uh, for what I wanted to say. So uh, thank you very much for hosting this. A uh, lot of great information and policies that you have shared. I actually had a comment and a request. Um, my comment was uh, earlier on during the section where you talked about policy changes for voucher amounts and you mentioned EPTOs. I think one of the things you said was the highest battery capacity EPTO that's currently eligible for funding under the HVIP program is 15 kilowatt hours. Just wanted to get a small correction to that on record. Um, our EPTO system, I represent, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, I represent Wiretech, uh, which is called Smart PTO, is HVIP eligible today, and the battery capacities for those systems are 14.4 uh, kilowatt hours and 21.6 kilowatt hours. So those two are currently HVIP eligible. Uh, but my request is around the proposal to add a new category of uh, EPTO, and you mentioned that uh, this will have a voucher amount of uh, $50,000. Uh, for EPTOs of higher battery capacities of 30 kilowatt hours or more. We have this year introduced our largest battery capacity on our EPTOs, which is 28.8 kilowatt hours. And I wanted to know if uh, this was open for discussion, uh, the battery capacity for which the higher um, funding amount will be eligible. Uh, we would like to have a conversation with you, not here, obviously, but separately and talk to you about the product that we have. Um, we're putting in an application for eligibility and approval for that system uh, into, HWIP, uh, into the HWIP program soon. And it's currently available on uh, international EMV full EV chassis. That's the specific product that's been created for EV chassis. And so we believe that uh, if we can get the advantage of this uh, additional funding amount, the new category that is proposed, we'd like to offer up that because it's just slightly lower than what the what the battery capacity that you have mentioned. So just wanted to put that request in there. If this is something that we should talk to you guys about separately, I'm more than happy to provide references and details and all of that. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Angeli. Um, we would be more than happy to, to discuss um, in more detail um, about your specific technology and your recommendations. Um, and thank you for the clarification on the um, 15 kilowatt hour. Um, <laughs> what I meant to say and apparently did not say very clearly uh, was that currently the way our voucher amounts are structured is that the highest bin um, for voucher amounts is 15 um, kilowatt hours or greater. Um, so I appreciate you pointing out that there are indeed technologies um, in HVIP that are eligible now and um, that are higher than 15 kilowatt hours. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Andy Schwartz. Andy, I've unmuted your mic. Hey, thanks so much. Um, you have a few, few comments, um, largely related to, or really exclusively related to the fleet size limits. Um, you know, first, I just want to note that I, I don't see how the data presented today supports the view that larger fleets are crowding out smaller fleets, um, particularly given that there appears to be a non-trivial amount of funding currently unsubscribed in standard HVIP today, and despite the fact that large fleets are currently eligible. Um, and as another commenter stated earlier, to the degree this is a concern going forward, it could be reasonably addressed with a carve-out rather than categorically excluding larger fleets. Um, another data point that I think is important um, is the share of medium and heavy-duty vehicles in California that are in large fleets. Based on some data that I received from the CARB staff um, several months ago, my understanding is that large fleets represent a very large share of the total number of medium and heavy duty vehicles in California. And if this is correct, it just strikes me as very odd that at this early stage in the market's transition, CARB would wanna exclude such a large swath of the market, um, particularly given the important role that larger fleets play in proving out zero emission technologies and seeding the secondary market. Um, lastly, I want to say that I share the skepticism that other speakers have expressed regarding the unsubstantiated assertion that large fleets will purchase these vehicles anyway. Um, just, I, I fundamentally disagree with that view. It's not, you know, our impression of the market. Um, I will say Tesla is on the record supporting lower per vehicle incentives for larger fleets, 
which we see as a perfectly reasonable means of addressing the relative advantages that larger fleets may enjoy, um, while also um, allowing uh, enabling funds to support more vehicles and emission reductions. Um, we've also been on record supporting uh, carve outs for smaller fleets, but we just think that the wholesale exclusion of larger fleets is a bridge too far and, you know, frankly, just wildly premature. Um, I know you've heard me say that stuff before, so sorry to be a, um, a one trick pony on this issue, but just I, I think it's important to hear, um, hear this, you know, hear these concerns from, uh, from industry. So I appreciate the time. Thanks, Andy, um, for, for sharing those um, the comments. Um, one thing I will note, I, I knew you mentioned that it it seems as though we have a substantial amount of funding remaining in each step. Um, we have a very small percentage of the funding that was initially available for each step this year are currently remaining. Um, so while there is $44 million remaining in each step standard, um, we have been open for just under three months. Um, and really our goal with, with HVEP is to make sure that those incentive dollars are continuously available um, so that fleets are able to have the incentives um, when they need them and when they're making their purchase decisions. Um, we know that that not having the funding continuously available presents challenges um, for, for all fleets, but it's particularly challenging for for those public agencies, many of whom we heard speak today about the challenges with procurement cycles and co-funding, um, as well as for smaller fleets that are really sensitive um, to price and timing constraints. Um, so we do think that these changes are necessary. And while there is some funding remaining in HVEP, it's really unlikely to, to be something that's able to make it through the entire rest of um, this year until new funding is available in the program. Yeah, if I can just respond really quickly, you know, I, I guess I don't though understand why proposals, for example, to reduce the incentive that larger fleets are able to get on a per vehicle and on a per vehicle basis wouldn't be kind of your starting point, along with carve outs that ensure that smaller fleets get a significant, you know, get a, a reasonable share of the funds. I mean, it just seems like strange to me to jump to a categorical exclusion of a market segment that is so vitally important to the evolution of the of the industry and the transition. It just seems, again, as I said, it seems premature given that there are other options on the table that could be pursued. Yeah, and I, I understand that. And I, there are a number of different options um, that could all get us to a place that um, really helps to manage demand within HVIP. Um, but that's not the only goal within the HVIP program. Um, we, we have a number of different policy goals that we're trying to achieve, and those are really laid out within our HVIP guiding principles. And when we look through all of those principles and what we're trying to achieve, making sure that our incentive dollars are really motivating purchase decisions and that we're supporting more equitable investments um, amongst the other um, categories on the list, we really do find um, that having these fleet size limits is really the best way for us to drive forward all of our goals within HVIP. Um, while we certainly could reduce voucher amounts for larger fleets, and that is something that we are considering as part of our contingency provision, um, contingency provisions um, for the fleet size limits, um, we, we still want to make sure that the incentives are really driving purchase decisions and not just supporting free riders. Um, so that's that's part of the concern that we have um, with those measures that would just be reducing voucher amounts for large fleets right off the bat. All right, well, I think we're actually getting pretty close to time. Um, so let's take one more comment and then we'll go into wrap up and discuss next steps. Uh, next up, we have LaDonna Williams. LaDonna, I have unmuted your mic. Yes, thank you. I didn't know if I'd get an opportunity again, so I just thought, let me throw it in there. I wanted to say thank you guys for the information. And also, even though we can't see the participants, I'm sure you can. And even though you guys have been responsive to our issues, so I wanna thank you for that as well and making yourselves available you know, to answer questions one-on-one, -on -one, um, make it, you know, helping this be a little more clear. And I'm not gonna apologize for being repetitive and keep asking you guys questions. 
because the community keeps asking us. So we've encouraged some of them to participate on these calls so that they can also have direct information, hearing it from you all, helping them to have the confidence to engage in these processes and helping them directly understand from you guys, not the middleman, because middlemen have been missing us, but now they are starting to see that they actually can engage and can get some benefits and that of course, knowledge is power. And so I just wanted to say thank you guys um, for these presentations. You've also put up, um, uh, what do we call these PowerPoints or information that folks can follow along rather than you just talking at us. Um, so just wanted to take an opportunity to say thank you. And hopefully the folks that we you know, brought on board, they know who they are, we'll reach out to you guys, but we'll ensure we'll be following up as well. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And we, I, I just wanna to acknowledge too that we really appreciate um, all of the community members who are able to join this evening and small fleet owner and operators who joined this evening and were asking questions. Um, we really appreciate your time. We know it's hard to find time um, to sit through these webinars um, and greatly appreciate your suggestions and are more than happy to, to, con to continue to engage um, and answer any questions that you have about, about our programs and um, how you can receive incentives to help get you into a zero emission truck. Um, so uh, with that, let's finish up and move on to next steps. Um, so as a reminder, there is still plenty of time to share feedback on the HVIP policy changes and the fiscal year 2022-2023 funding plan for clean transportation incentives. Um, on July 21st, we will host our second workshop on the funding plan for clean transportation incentives. Um, we, will, we will put a link where you can register for that in the chat. Um, before this workshop, we will release a draft funding plan, which will include our preliminary recommendations for funding allocations and policy changes to projects, including HVIP. Uh, this draft funding plan will serve as a guide for the conversations we will have at the July 21st workshop. Note that since we expect that the draft funding plan will be released in mid-July, we may not have time to reflect all of the feedback and comments we received today, um, but you can rest assured that we are considering all of the comments that you shared today and any comments that will be emailed in um, as we continue to prepare the proposed funding plan, uh, which we expect to release in October. Uh, we expect to take the proposed funding plan to our board for consideration in November. These dates are tentative and may change, so please be sure to keep an eye out for Gov delivery emails and check our website for updates. Um, I'd encourage everyone to subscribe to our Gov delivery emails if you haven't already, um, and we will also make sure to put a link for that into the chat. So again, um, I'd like to really reiterate that our doors are always open. And we're happy to meet outside of our formal workshop and work group process to discuss HVIP. Um, you're welcome to submit any written comments to me via email. And I'm also happy to set up time to meet individually if you have additional questions. My email address is on the screen. Um, so with that, thank you all for participating in our work group today and for sharing your thoughts and feedback. Have a great rest of your evening.